Welcome back. It's time for another edition of Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports Original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. I am Scott Cabranson, your host, joined with my, or I should say, joining me as always, my partner, that is Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. You catch his work there. You can also catch his Raiders specific work where he's a columnist. That's at sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. You can also follow my work up on sportsnot.com where I write about the Raiders. In fact, I got a piece today you can check out on the Raiders and team culture. And you can follow me on X, LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. You'll find Silver and Black today. If you're watching us on YouTube, thanks for being with us. Hit that subscribe and the notifications bell. And uh, make sure you take part in the chat. The chat's always fun, always good. And we appreciate that very much. All right, we're back here recording this on Monday, uh, of course, which is Memorial Day. So uh, we remember all those fallen who gave their lives for our country. And I hope you had a great long weekend and you remembered those folks in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, But we're going to talk about football and Mo, we had, of course, OTA started last week in Las Vegas. A bunch of different workouts coming up before we get to the real stuff, as I will call it. Of course, you're going to have mandatory mini camp and all that. But really, until we get to camp in July, some of the questions we all have about this Raiders team. And of course, for Raider Nation, very positive. They're very upbeat about what's happening with this team, not only on the field, but of course, from that culture perspective with um, Antonio Pierce's head coach. And continuing what he started last year. But Mo, we look at OTAs and of course you can't, you know, you see things come out and and our good friends who cover the team on the ground, people like Vinny Bonsignor and others who are there and they're telling us what they see, but you have to take it with a little bit of grain of salt. This is just workouts in helmets, shorts, and shirts. Nothing specific that we can read into as far as some of these roles, some of the competitions for these roles. But when you look at last week and you look at the OTAs, uh, anything catch your eye, anything from a positive perspective, anything that concerns you that you heard coming out of Henderson and, of course, uh, the Raiders headquarters there as well? Well, Scott, you know it's May, so we got to stay positive. Um, (laughs) So I'll look at something that Vinny Bonsignor wrote in the the, uh, Review Journal, and that that was about Byron Young. You didn't hear, mm. you haven't heard much about him this offseason. Vinny wrote that, you know, there are there is some playing time left for him if he want if he's able to take it. Of course, Rays did sign Christian Wilkins, as he noted, he's going to be the main guy in the middle. They did bring back Adam Butler and John Jenkins. But Bilal Nichols is now in Arizona. Jerry Tillery has moved on, I believe, to Minnesota. So now there is so there's a there's a rotational spot over for Byron Young. And as a third round pick, you usually want to see your third round picks play by their second year Byron Young I believe suited up for about six games last year didn't make an impact a lot of people not talking about him because the spotlight is on Christian Wilkins but Byron Young could crack the rotation you want to see him produce especially with his draft pedigree uh we'll see what he does in the middle but I think his his rot his spot in rotation could be important because Adam Butler and John Jenkins aren't young guys uh they're 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 veteran players who've been around the block so Beyond this year, you can't really count on those guys re-signing again. And, of course, Christian Wilkins is going to be there. But is Byron Young going to be that second guy next to Christian Wilkins for the future? Right. And I think you look at this situation with the roster, and you know we'll talk about this over the course of the next few months, clearly, as the Raiders gear up for the season. But there's, there's a lot of excitement, and I think very high expectations – from Raider Nation on that defensive unit, Um, not just up front, which you talked about, but also everywhere from linebackers. Of course, um, you have you have Robert Splane coming back and and you have uh, all those guys. Malcolm Coons, of course, everybody's expecting him to make because he finished so strong last year, expecting him to take that next step as well. But I think you touch on something that's really important here, Mo, which is um, you have to have the depth too, right? And, and that front up, having Christian Wilkins there is huge. Don't get me wrong, but you're talking too about the interior of that defensive line. Um, we have to see, I think, some of these young players and the veterans step up next to Wilkins on the inside 
uh, which has been a problem for the Raiders. They didn't have terrible performance or even bad performance last year there, but you certainly want to be able to improve in the middle so guys like Mac Max Crosby, guys like Malcolm Coons, uh, can free up a little bit and be able to put more of a pass rush, especially with the AFC, not just the AFC West, but the entire AFC and the dynamic quarterbacks they're going to face in 2024. Yeah, absolutely. So that defensive line... Two things. For one, I said the defensive line should be able to help a young secondary. I know there are concerns. I have concerns about the cornerback position because they haven't signed a veteran. Uh, I noted this in my Sports Not sports not piece. Vinny wrote this. I believe Vic Tafer to Sean Reed wrote this in their OTA observations that at cornerback, they haven't signed a guy yet. And it could be because, A, Ja'Cory and Bennett will have a shot to lock down one of the starting spots, or, B, they may want to take a look at the rookies before they – before they sign a veteran. So if they like what they see out of, you know, the Camry and Richardson and or MJ Devonshire, then they may not sign a veteran quarterback. We'll see. But that defensive line is going to help that back in the secondary, whoever is back there. The other thing is, as you mentioned, when you're playing quarterbacks, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson this season, even Justin Herbert in the division, you're going to need defensive linemen who are going to get to the quarterback. We know what Max Crosby can do. Uh, Malcolm Kuntz had a pretty good leap last year. But you also need a pass rush from the interior. Now, J Christian Wilkins should be able to do that. But when he's not on the field, because he's going to, even as a starter, he's only going to play maybe 60 to 70% of the stats. When he's not on the field, what are they going to do inside? Because Tyree Wilson's primary position is still defensive end. So when Christian Wilkins is not in the field, they're going to need somebody like Byron Young, along with Adam Jenkins and Adam, uh, Adam Butler and John Jenkins to rush the passer. Yeah, and, and Tyree Wilson spoke to the media early last week, and he talked about uh, coming into this camp and, and and how it was different for him and um, you know not having to overcome that injury, right? So he's not coming off an injury. He did that last year, slow start. He got stronger as the year went on, and now he gets to just focus on football. I think that was really encouraging to hear that. And they do need him, like you said. I mean, he's a first rounder, so so you understand. Last year, he really didn't start getting geared up to the second half of the season, and we saw some nice play out of him. Uh, but how important is he going to be for that line too? Because as you said, you, when you're rotating guys in, especially in Patrick Graham's system, where you see that happen a little bit more, and they change it up. When you see if Tyree Wilson can come on strong and play. Uh, it doesn't even have to be lights out, just even better than he did last year. To me, that's also going to take some of the pressure off Max Crosby so he can just be who he is. I mean, yes, he's a freak of nature, and you talked about rotation. Yes, nobody plays as many downs as Max Crosby. Now, some of that was out of necessity, but if Tyree Wilson can come on strong, and we'll see when he gets to camp, uh, that would be a huge boom for this team. Yeah, the Raiders will have one of the best, should have one of the best pass rushes in the league if Tari Wilson uh, starts off the season strong because then you have Max Crosby, you have Malcolm Koontz, you have Tyree Wilson, and then you have Christian Wilkins on the inside. So you'll have four guys who can legitimately get you several sacks in, in a single season with Max Crosby and Christian Wilkins able to get you maybe double digits. Even Malcolm Koontz could probably get you double digits depending on what the rotation is like. But if you can have one of the best pass rushes in the league, it can neutralize, not only neutralize other teams' offenses, but it takes the pressure off your offense to have to score 30 points a game because the other team is racking up points and going up and down the field. So the, if that defense can come along, it was ninth last year in scoring, it can really even the playing field despite the, I guess, the quarterback position that's being talked about is questionable for the Raiders. I feel it's questionable. A lot of other people feel like it's questionable. If the, if the offense is only putting up 20, you know, 24 points, that may be all they need if the defense is only allowing <laughs> 16 to 17 points a game. No, it's a good point. I, I see a lot of folks in Raider Nation talking about that because of the question at quarterback, which we'll get into in a second. But you look at that situation, and if the defense can be one of those top 10 units, look, it can happen, right? I mean, they showed such great promise towards the end of the season. Once Antonio Pierce took over, we saw them really explode. So if they can do that again, you're right. It takes pressure off, off them too. Also, talking about the cornerback position, 
if they don't sign a veteran, which I still think they do, and this isn't uncommon, especially with some of these bigger money guys, uh, you want to try to wait as close to camp. And some of those guys don't want to go to camp anyway if they're veterans. And so so I wouldn't freak out out there if, if they haven't signed anybody once we get into uh, this next month coming up in June, even towards the end of June, moving towards camp. Some of these guys will sign on the eve of camp or they'll sign once camp starts. But back to that interior and also defensive end on the edge, if they can have that kind of pass rush, Mo, then you might be able to get by with some of these young guys if they come out and play lights out. Now, it's hard to make that transition from cornerback in college to the professional level in the NFL. But if they can really be beasts up front, that's going to take a lot of pressure off the back end. Yeah, we'll see. You mentioned that. You know, the cornerbacks don't want to go to camp. When you're over 30 years old, you don't want to sweat it out in OTAs and mandatory mini camp. You'll be like, look, I'll be there in August. <laughs> I'll get used to yeah. my teammates. Because if you're if you're a 30, 31 year old cornerback like stuff like Stefan Gilmore or Steven Nelson or one of these guys, you know, you've played in cover three, you know what cover two or cover one is. You don't, I mean, you don't really need you know, May, June practices to, to get up to speed with the defense. You can be plugged right in in August and just play right away. And those two guys I mentioned, Gilmore and Steven Nelson, are day one starters. If right. you sign one of those guys, they're going to start. And that's just that's just the bottom line to it. You know, now if you get one of a bargain bin corner, he, he'll need May and June to get up to speed because he may not. He's not a roster lock. So what it tells me is that the Raiders are going to sign a cornerback. It'll probably be someone who will start day one or week one of the season if they bring in a veteran sometime in July, August. And right, like you said, a veteran like that, a couple of names, you mentioned Nelson, you mentioned um, Gilmore. Those guys, th Patrick Graham's defensive scheme is not something so different or unusual uh, to these guys that it would take so much time. It's not like an offense, I'll put it that way. If you're a quarterback and you come in and yeah. you haven't played in an offense, much different situation. So we'll keep an eye on that one as well. We switch to the offensive side, and of course, we have we have some questions there too. Offensive line continues to – we'll see what happens, how it all shakes out. Um, of course, Colton Miller, the anchor there, and of course, Jackson Power Johnson, the the, the the rookie that they drafted out of Oregon, who's expected to probably slot in at left guard. I would love to see him there, as you made the point on an earlier show, that boy, having Miller and, and Johnson next to each other would be amazing. Then you just got to continue to worry about, okay, who solidifies that right spot? Is it Mumford Jr.? You know, who goes there and, and how does that all look? So that's one of the questions. Uh, also, you know, look, Colton Miller, uh, has had some injuries and so we'll see how healthy he is once they start putting pads on and start getting to work there the quarterback position of course we know what the battle is going to be it's going to be a great one and i think this is great for this team to have a veteran like gardner Minshew, to have a second year player like aiden o'connell compete and whoever does the best in camp and comes out of that uh, wins that starting role with o'connell maybe having the leg up obviously as as uh, Antonio Pierce has mentioned. So you look at that and 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 you then look past that. Um, is there a situation here where the Raiders do need to, I mean, they have a couple guys in camp, but is there a situation here where you think the Raiders need to bring in another quarterback for any purpose whatsoever? Not unless Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Mitchell get hurt. I don't see a reason to bring in another cornerback at this point in the offseason simply because Aiden O'Connell played well at the end of last season. Of course, he did struggle against some of the better teams, but statistically, pretty decent finish to the 2023 year. Garner Minshew, I know pro bowler, that label is a little hollow, but played well considering the circumstance having to take over for Anthony Richardson last year. Now, he had Shane Steichen, who I, who I said on the last show, elevates his quarterbacks. You saw it with Jalen Hurts, you saw it with Justin Herbert. But for what it's worth, Garner Minshew has played well, even in going back to his time in Jacksonville. And that team was winning one. I think the team won one game in one of his starting years. But his his stats, his passing numbers were pretty decent. So I think between those two, I don't think any other corner quarterback coming in would beat out any of those two guys, unless you bring in a, a bona fide starter for some reason. Maybe a team trades a starting quarterback. That's the only reason I would see the Raiders bringing in a quarterback. But again, when you do a trade for a quarterback, you mentioned this with the with the offense. You want to get that quarterback in as soon as possible because you're installing that offense around that quarterback. You're building the offense essentially around that quarterback. So you don't want to bring in a starter 
in August or right before or weeks before the week one of the season, you're going to bring in that, that quarterback at the latest late June, early July. I don't know if you remember this, mm-hmm. Scott, when the Patriots moved on from Tom Brady and they were looking for a bridge gap starter, they signed Cam Newton late June. And he wound up starting the season. He didn't have a great year. It was statistically his worst passing season of his career. And that's not a coincidence. He came in late. I think he beat out Jared Stidham for the job. Didn't have a great season. Wound up getting benched during the season. But, again, you want to have that quarterback in ASAP because he has to get used to that offense, and you want to build that offense around him. Yep, absolutely. All right, listen, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, there was a rumor floated and, and a recommendation floated about the Raiders perhaps trading for another quarterback. What? Yes, I'll explain when we come back here on Silver and Black today and Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. You're with Mo and Scott. We're coming back right after these words. Welcome back. Segment number two here on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition. And we appreciate you guys being with us. Hope you had a great long weekend. Mo Moten, Scott Branson, back with you. We're talking Raiders football. And uh, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. If you're with us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, the notifications bell, and give us a thumbs up if you would. We would appreciate that very much. All right, Mo, I have to share this with you because I found this, and and I want to say this up front with Raider Nation because, you know, Raider Nation doesn't miss a thing. I'm not advocating for this, nor do I think necessarily that it's something that could possibly happen. But over on fan side, and I'm going to share this for those of you watching us on uh, YouTube, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you this, Mo. Um, on fan sided, a writer named Mark Powell. Now, listen, we're writers. We make content. Uh, it's a time of the year where things are are pretty slow. Uh, but the Cowboys. I want to I want to talk about this. Uh, the Cowboys. We saw. Um, uh, we talked about free agent quarterbacks next year, and that Dak Prescott would be the 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 the, the top free agent quarterback next year. But everything we're hearing out of Dallas, even though. He said that money's not why he plays football, which I understand what he's saying. When people were asking if he was concerned that that Jerry Jones hasn't approached him about a contract extension. But from all intents and purposes, everything we're hearing is that the Cowboys are working on that. And my guess would be by the time they get to camp, uh, they will sign Dak Prescott to an extension. As such, uh, uh, Mr. Powell here on Fan Sided okay. wrote a piece entitled, Hey, a Cowboys Raiders trade to inject some excitement in the quarterback room. Now you're saying, what? Well, you just said Dak Prescott's going to sign in Dallas. Yes. He he writes here that the, the Raiders uh, could possibly trade or maybe recommending trading for Trey Lance. Yes, the Raiders trading for Trey Lance to inject, quote unquote, some excitement in the QB room. Now, I don't know that that generates excitement in the QB room myself. And what he says here, Mo, is he says his, his kind of scenario was – the Raiders get Trey Lance and they send the Cowboys uh, a 2025 fifth round and a 2026 seventh round pick to the Cowboys for Trey Lance, uh, who the Raiders could then perhaps have as a guy to develop maybe if he can ever live up to any of his potential that so many saw uh, as a, a, a quarterback with the Raiders. Now, again, I'm not advocating for this, but I did want to – get your opinion on it and tell me what you think uh, as far as um, the possibility or even the idea of something like a Trey Lance to the Raiders for basically two, uh, I wouldn't call them throwaway picks, but very, very affordable picks in a fifth and a seventh in two consecutive years. Okay, so three things. One, I don't even think it would take that much. I mean, we've seen <laughs> Justin Fields I move know. for less than that. Yes. <laughs> and Justin Fields actually started last year. Trey Lance hasn't started in how long has it been? It's been multiple years. So you could probably get Trey Lance for a 2026 pick if you're mm-hmm. the Raiders. Uh, two is a lot of Raider fans brought up Trey Lance during uh, uh, Trey Lance during the offseason and asked, hey, what about Trey Lance? How about we, you know, kick the tires on him? He was top three pick in his draft class. Uh, hasn't didn't pan out in San Francisco. Obviously, they traded him to to Dallas. Why not? He's young. He's mobile. He's got the mobility. Uh, you could develop him into a potential starter and see what he's got. And I was all for it because yeah, I've always said if you can get a quarterback with upside on a cheap contract, you do that and you pile up those quarterbacks until you find the one, the friend, the potential franchise guy. Number three. We've seen quarterbacks like Trey Lance get traded 
during the offseason, usually around preseason, after the first or second week of preseason. I remember Nick Mullins was traded uh, in, during the preseason. Number three quarterbacks get traded um, during the offseason. So I, I can see it as a possibility. It's a trade that I would actually pull off if I were the Raiders. Again, I would probably start off saying, hey, we'll, we'll give you a conditional six, you know, six round 2026 pick for Trey Lance. And, you know, what what else what else is Dallas going to get from him? Because he doesn't have a tr really a trade market. He hasn't played other than people looking at him because he has potential as a former first round pick. But if I'm the Raiders, I would do it simply because who knows if, if a O'Connell and and Mark Garner Minshew are very mediocre. You're still going to draft a quarterback early, probably in 2025. But you have Trey Lance there in the mix, just in case you you miss out on a quarterback, just like you missed out on a quarterback this year. So you have that young quarterback in the room who has the physical tools to potentially be a starter. So it's it's definitely a player I'd be interested in. But again, I would probably offer a conditional six round 2026 pick to see what the Cowboys say. Yeah, and it's interesting about the Trey Lance piece, and and I haven't I haven't I saw this as we were about an hour before we went on uh, to to do the show this time, so I haven't really thought too much about. Trey Lance, of course, again, Trey Lance, where he was drafted, you have to put aside, right? We know what happened with San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We know he didn't work out there. They trade him to Dallas. He would cost the Raiders $5 million, and then he doesn't have a contract for next year, right? So so, so you would be mm -hmm. basically getting him. You have to pay him five plus whatever draft pick you send, like you said, maybe a conditional six or something like that. And so there's not there's not a lot of downside there except for a little bit of, of money. The, the dead cap hit would be five million dollars, uh, where you have uh, Aiden O'Connell's only going to be a million, and then Gardner Minshew, of course, is at twelve and a half million. So he's the guy in the room. But you look at that and you say, okay, you're talking about eighteen million for three quarterbacks. That's nothing today. That's zero. So mm -hmm. you would be taking a risk and saying, hey, if the kid comes in um, and 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 competes at all or just shows them something that they're interested in. But we've talked about before on this show a lot lately about Luke Getze and the fact that Luke Getze has not uh, developed a young quarterback either. Uh, how does that play into the decision? I mean, listen, obviously Antonio Pierce has all the trust in the world right now in Luke Getze because he hired him. But uh, would there be any concerns for you there bringing in that young quarterback when we don't know what Luke Getze is able to do with young quarterbacks outside of what we saw in Chicago? Well, the concern is all about Luke Getze. So whatever quarterback, whatever young quarterback Luke Getze gets, my concern is, is he going to be able to develop that quarterback, regardless if it's Trey Lance or any other guy 25 years or younger? But that doesn't mean that you don't try to bring in a young quarterback for him to develop and allow him to prove himself, because that's what he has to do this up se upcoming season. But I, what I will say about Trey Lance is that he's closer to what Luke Getze had in Chicago than either of the starting quarterbacks of the Raiders, potential starting quarterbacks that the Raiders have now. Trey Lance, again, a physical toolsy, what they call toolsy quarterback, who has the mobility. That's mm. that's a lot closer to Justin Fields than Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. So that's another reason I'd be okay with Trey Lance because he's more in line of what Luke Getze had in Chicago and Justin Fields right over a Gardner Minshew who is mobile but not as mobile as Trey Lance or Justin Fields and Aiden O'Connell who's – Someone wrote in their article, I forgot who wrote it, is statuesque. Yes. I think it was my guy, uh, Sobo at Bleach Report <laughs> called A the Kyle statuesque. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I bring in Trey Lance simply because I think he'd be more of a fit with Luke Getze and then see, you know, what Luke Getze can get out of him. Now, you mentioned some of the positives with Trey Lance. Uh, and, and I think the, with the reaction we're going to get. And I bet you we can see it in the chat right here on YouTube, too, which is, wait a minute, we have a young quarterback. We have Aiden O'Connell. Yes, he has, like you said, he's not exactly fleet of foot. He doesn't move a ton. Uh, but if you have a young quarterback already, why would you bring in another young and, and I would say experimental quarterback from the percent perspective of the Raiders would be trying to just maybe strike gold with a guy that hasn't been able to work his way through two teams already? Simply because the competition. Right now, we we don't know if Aiden O'Connell is a franchise guy. You and I both see him as a high-end backup, low-end starter. So if the upside for Trey Lance is higher simply because of his mobility and his quote-unquote tools, why wouldn't you bring in competition? That's essentially what, you, what you're doing with Gardner Minshew, an older veteran, yes. But until you crown a guy as your franchise quarterback, as your starter, as I said, you're bringing quarterbacks until you find the guy. So it's a competition until you find your, your franchise quarterback, whether it's a veteran 
or a guy who's younger. Trey Lance is only 24 years old, just turned 24, I believe. It's a competition until you find your guy. Right. And then uh, people will also refer to Anthony Brown being on the roster, another young quarterback who's only costing them 900000 I think it is around there somewhere from a cash perspective. Uh, and and he showed some things, you know, when he played in Baltimore, the times that he was able to, to get on the field there with Lamar Jackson's injuries and what whatnot. But I, th- I think with, with um, quarterbacks particularly, now you might be out there saying, oh, Trey Lance sucks. And I'm not saying that the guy did anything to deserve a starting job anywhere, but for the cost and the opportunity to maybe find a guy. The other thing is I look at this and I say to your, to your point about competition, absolutely. And then we got to look at last year. Last year we had more injured quarterbacks than any other year in the history of the NFL. Will that happen again this year? Probably not as many, but um, you got to also think too, if one of those, those two guys, whoever wins out between O'Connell and Minshew, if one of those guys goes down, then your third quarterback come, becomes very important because you need to have a guy there uh, should you need someone to come in and, and spot start or relieve somebody if they get injured. And so I think that depth issue, just like you have it on the offensive line, you have it on the defensive line, you also need that at the most important position on the field. You do. But at, like, I go back to the, the main point here is the Raiders – Reportedly, we're interested in a quarterback in this year's draft. Mm-hmm. They signed Garner Minshew, so obviously they're not all in on Aiden O'Connell yet. Aiden O'Connell has to prove himself to be the starter. So until you have someone who steps up and, and takes the starting job and says, and, you know, basically says, "I'm the guy," you're just bringing in quarterbacks. I, I, I've said it during the off season. I said I'm all in favor of bringing in young quarterbacks on cheap contracts until they find their guy. And you do that, like I said, you do that until you find that guy. I'm not saying Trey Lance is going to be the guy, but you give him an opportunity. And I, as you said, the chat people are going to say, Trey Lance isn't that good. I think Trey Lance's issue is that he hasn't been able to play a lot of football. Let's remember there was a COVID year before he came into the NFL. So he played like one, he started like one game before the 49ers drafted him top three in his draft class in 2021. And then he had to battle essentially with Jimmy Garoppolo to, you know, to get the job. And then they had Brock Purdy there also after Trey Mm -hmm. Lance got hurt, because remember he started out in the season as the guy, but then he got hurt. Brock Purdy, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo comes in, then he gets hurt. Then Trey Lance comes in. um, Brock Purdy comes in, excuse me, and takes over the job. But I think Trey Lance's issue is that he hasn't played a lot of football. So you get him on the field, you let you get him on the field to get some reps during the preseason. I would essentially let him play the entire preseason and see what type of growth you get out of him. You might be surprised about what he turns into, and you may see some potential in him as a starter. And he may develop into maybe a, not a higher than a low level starter, maybe maybe a, a serviceable mid level guy who has some upside. Because let's remember, sometimes it's also about fit. Sometimes the teams that draft these quarterbacks aren't the best fit because of whatever reason, the competition, the situation. San Francisco had some guys behind him who took over. But if you get a quarterback on the field in the right system and he's the right fit with a certain offensive coordinator, with a certain personnel, you may get different results. And that may be Trey Lance. Who knows? Yeah. And and the Cowboys did that too. I think, I think, you know, Jerry Jones, he took us, I think some criticism for going out and getting that because of some of the contract, of course, they voided some of it and restructured it, but you look at that situation there, Mike McCarthy, everything he said so far during this off season points to Trey Lance, not really being in the picture much there uh, and their commitment to Dak Prescott uh, when they sign him will obviously be there. And so if you're a young quarterback, not a great place to be, because you're not going to really have a chance to start. Now, they also signed him last year or traded for him last year because they weren't sure with Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott has had health issues, right? So so I see why the Cowboys did it, uh, but now it looks like they're ready to turn the page on that. So it'll be something interesting to watch. Uh, on the offense too, Mo, the other thing is a lot of people I've seen, and we've talked about the fact that the Raiders may end up bringing in Uh, a one or two more running backs because you look at the running back situation, they signed Alexander Madison to a $2 million kind of prove it deal for just this year. And of course you have Zamir white there who a lot of people are excited about what they saw out of him last year, even though he's a very different type of back than Josh Jacobs, we're going to see running back by committee. I think a lot more than we've seen in the past, but when you look at Madison and white, let's say as the two leaders of the pack there is, do you see the Raiders or do you see any, um, any need for them to bring in somebody else to, to make that more competitive there too. 
maybe the unpopular opinion, but I don't. If Madison is going to take, you know, portion of the early down snaps along with Zamir White, you re-sign. Remember, the Raiders re-signed Amir Abdullah. It wasn't like Amir Abdullah is, is a holdover from last year. They actually re-signed him. and He's a pass catching back out of the backfield. And then you drafted Dylan Lowby. He's I, I feel like he's going to have a third down role. So right mm-hmm. there, that's four. That's four running backs you have already. So if you sign a veteran running back, how is he cracking the rotation other than maybe special teams? Uh, but I, I just don't see the need simply because you already have two early down backs, White and Madison, and then you have two essential third down backs and Amir Abdullah and Dylan Lowby. And then, you know, some people still have hope that maybe Sincere McCormick turns into something other than a practice squad player. I know he's had some injuries, but he's also still on the roster technically. So I, I don't I don't see the need for another running back unless there's an injury. Right. And I think that obviously the wide receiver room got stronger with the veterans they signed there too. So I think they have good competition. And I agree with you at running back. I think they have good competition at all of those positions. The big question mark just remains again on the offensive line and what they're going to do there. And, and that's really not going to shake out till we get to camp. Um, do they sign anybody else there? I don't think so. I think too, unless somebody comes available that they didn't expect that would be a clear upgrade on that right side of the line because I think they have enough bodies already to compete there. Uh, and it's just going to come down to whether Tom Telesco and, and Antonio Pierce feel like they, and Luke Getze, they feel like they have those guys to compete. And out of whoever wins there, they would feel comfortable rolling into the season with those two players on the right side. The only, the only way I see the Raiders signing a right tackle is if DJ Glaze moves inside to guard. Mm. So, the Raiders, the Raiders sign Andrews Pete. He's, I believe they said he's mostly going to be on the left side because he's played mostly on the left side with the New Orleans Saints. Left guard mostly played left tackle last season, right? Cody Whitehair is a center slash guard, but he's played mostly left guard and center. So that's another guy that could be on the left side to spell, you know, who, if someone gets hurt at left guard or the starter, go, you know, isn't able to play up to up to par. But on that right side, you're assuming Jackson Powers Johnson is either the right guard or left guard. I, I made the case that he should be the left guard. But let's say the Raiders flip him to right guard. And they don't flip Dylan Parham to right guard, right? You're still asking, okay, what about that right tackle spot? Who is the who's going to be the the spell at right tackle or the primary swing tackle? Now people say, well, Andrew Speed, as I said, he's probably mostly going to be on the left side. So what if they want someone who's going to primarily be on the right side if a month or junior either a doesn't play well at right tackle or let's say he gets hurt who steps in at right tackle if dj glaze plays guard and then you people say dalton wagner dalton wagner everyone loves to bring up he's like the favorite <laughs> obscure fringe roster guy that Raider, always Raider one Nation of them loves to bring up dalton wagner is like the, the key name there's always one every year that he's a fringe roster guy may not make the roster but raider nation loves him I, for, for some reason it's dalton wagner this year right what if Dalton Wagner doesn't even make the roster? What if he's a practice squad guy and DJ Glaze is a guard? The Raiders will probably have to sign a veteran right tackle just in case because you still want to have insurance if Thea Mumford just isn't that guy. Let's remember, even though Thea Mumford filled in at both left and right tackle, he's not a lock guarantee starter for the for the entire season. Now, they're giving him every opportunity to be that guy, but we still don't know what we have in Thayer Mumford yet. I, I, of course, we hope he is the guy at right tackle and the Raiders don't have to turn to anyone. But what if he's not? And DJ Glaze is not ready to play. Then you have to, in my opinion, you sign a veteran at that point. Right. Based on need, if something pops up. But but I do like what they're rolling with. I think that they, they feel like they have the talent there. And so they're going to let them compete and see how it all shakes out. Now, before we get to the break and then get to your calls in the Raider Nation mailbag uh, in our third segment, but the one thing I, I told you, I wrote a piece up on Sports Not about team culture and how important it is. And we've talked a lot about that because I think in many ways, the the excitement around the Raiders and what's happened, yes, uh, you know they did well at the end of last year uh, with, with Antonio Pierce at head coach. Antonio P- Pierce bringing back the swag and all that kind of stuff. We've seen a lot of that in the offseason. We've heard from a lot of the young players and the free agents who signed in Las Vegas saying that was one of the reasons. Um, and, and you and I have talked about it too, which is, look, it's so very important. How you start to build the culture in the building, we've seen the reports that, that training camp this year is so much different than it was last year. It's actually, well, not training camp, but OTAs even. Um, 
it was more disciplined. It was, uh, I think, more intense. But at the same time, guys to a man have said they're having more fun, which I think is big. Now, that's got to translate on the field. But this early stage, just in OTAs, even to hear that, I think, is a big deal because the, the national media is not buying into it yet because you got to win ball games. That's what it comes down to. People who are naysayers are not going to believe until you win ball games. But for this team and for the, the culture and for the, I think, chemistry – with the new people there, with the returning players there, um, that I shouldn't be, I should not be overlooked. I think Mo, because you have to get everybody to believe in that. And clearly, last year, with the Raiders starting off three and five under Josh McDaniels, not everybody was bought in. We kind of heard rumblings of that going into the season anyway, based on the previous year. But this is a very different situation, and very, very encouraging to hear that that's coming out. I'll say one guy that didn't seem bought into the Josh McDaniel system, and it, it was Michael Mayer. Did you hear some of the things that Michael Mayer said? Wow. Yes. I think one. I think I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said something along the lines is that, he, you know, he's now looking forward to coming into work now. Yes. He made it seem as he made it seem as if like he was not that he was checked out last year, but he wasn't excited to be a part of that team or come or come into work under Josh McDaniels. And he also said that the offense is a lot more simple. Than it was last year, so he'll be able to pick up the offense a lot faster. Luke Getzey's offense versus Josh McDaniels' offense, which has been notoriously known to be difficult for even veteran players. I think Devontae Adams noted that uh, in Josh McDaniels' first year with the team. So I think you'll see a lot more out of Michael Mann. I think he speaks for a lot of other young guys and maybe some older veterans too. That one, they're going to pick up the offense a lot faster and be able to start a lot faster. And two, as you said they're now excited to come into work and practice. They're now, they now don't mind staying late at practices because one of the things that have been that Bill Belichick disciples have been criticized of is long practice hours and minimal results. And now the, the players are excited to come to work and hoping to get those optimal results. And especially for a young player, you know, Mike, I think he even dropped the word miserable if I remember correctly. <laughs> and it, 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 and that, I don't care what you do for a living. If you're going to work every day and you, and you describe it, as miserable, it doesn't matter how good you are. It's very hard mentally, especially for a rookie to come in. And re we heard too, remember, Mo, we heard kind of rumors that that Michael Mayer, when he got drafted by the Raiders, was not very excited about it. And so it wasn't necessarily because it was the Raiders. I think that had to do with the coaching staff. And people talk, man. They know what's going on. Uh, and, and I think that his reputation – clearly preceded him and so for a player like michael mayer to talk about that and it's and it's great that he brought it up and said i don't feel that way anymore uh now it also helps that they brought in brock bauer so there's competition there it's different even though they're very different players in some ways uh the fact that they they recognize that is a huge deal and so uh you like to see that veterans will go about it in a different way i think we saw a lot of read between the lines last year from people like Devonte Adams and, and and so on uh, that you're not hearing so far this year, which is great, and uh, that's good. Also, it it also goes to the point for those of you who think that we're negative about Aiden O'Connell, which we are not, is that Aiden O'Connell, when he did do well last year, uh, obviously after he started was when when um, when Antonio Pierce took over. But to be in a building as a rookie quarterback to absorb that offense and to do okay as he did. Uh, is pretty remarkable too. And so I, I like the fact that in going into year two, he's going to have a much more simplified offense, which will probably help him grow even more as we see him compete with Minshew. And that's why I say it's going to be a close quarterback competition. So because if you have a simpler offense for a young quarterback who did well under the circumstances last year in a more difficult, complex offensive system, you're expecting him to play you know, probably a lot better, have a quicker start. You know, won't have the issue with turnovers as he did in his first game against the Chargers last year. Uh, but it'll also be easier for a veteran like Garda Minshew, who's, who, see, who has seen a lot more than Aiden O'Connell. So while it's simplified for Aiden O'Connell, it's also simplified for Minshew, who's been around the block and played in a lot of offenses. So, I, again, I expect this to be a tight battle. This is not going to be a battle where you're going to know after week one who's the guy. Of course, practices, they say this a lot, that don't put too much stock – I should say, don't put more stock into preseason games than you do practices. Now, we don't get to see all of practices, but right. a lot of times those training camp practices in August 
provide the coaching staff with enough separation to say, okay, this guy's a front runner, this guy's a front runner. So just remember, just because let's say Aiden O'Connell is out playing Gardner Minshew in the preseason games, Gardner Minshew may look a lot better at the during the practices or vice versa. So just keep that in mind when you're, you know, looking at the tail of the tape between these guys. It's not just about the preseason games. It's also about what you're hearing about during these training camp practices. Yeah, and being a more accomplished veteran, Minshew, I don't think you'll see Minshew much in preseason. I think you'll see O'Connell a little bit, and then whoever they have 3-4, they'll, they'll play a lot more because you're right. The, the job, winning the number one job at quarterback is going to be done in practice like it usually is. Yes, we saw last year, of course, Aiden O'Connell had a great – preseason that certainly elevated his his image around the league and i think for fans that this kid actually has a little bit of something but it was josh mcdaniel so he didn't really care so that that is what it is but we'll see how it all rolls out okay uh great discussion we're going to take our final break when we come back we're going to get to your phone calls on the raider nation mailbag by the way if you want to call in 702-900-7869 702-900-7869 702 you could still email us by the way We'll read your email. Some people don't like to do the phone thing. That's totally cool. Just send it to us at mail at silver and black today. That's all spelled out mail at silver and black today.com. And we'll read your, I don't mind reading it for you. Uh, you can also text that number, by the way, just leave your name. I got a couple texts, but I didn't have any names. So if you text the 702-900-7869, uh, I will read it. Just put your name and where you're texting from. And we will read that as well. Okay, Mo and I are coming back to close out the show with the Raider Nation mailbag. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Welcome back. Segment number three of Home Stretch here on Silver and Black Today. Mo Moten, Scott Branson with you. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do us a favor. Subscribe wherever you get your audio. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe and the notifications bell. All right, this is a fun time. We always love it. We're doing it every show now, especially in the off season to get to what you guys want to say. And to do that, for those of you watching, I'm going to flash this up on the screen. For those of you listening, you'll hear my voice and I'll read it to you, which is <laughs> call us 702-900-7869, 702-900-7869. Leave your name, the city you're calling from, and your question or comments and we will get to them as we will do again on Thursday show too. So make sure you do that as well. All right, we're going to get out to our first call. This is our good friend Anders in Oakland who calls in uh, at least every other show. Uh, so we're going to get to Anders. Here's our first call on the Raider Nation mailbag. Hello, gentlemen. It's Anders from Oakland again. And you guys have to comment on Michael Mayer's press conference. Uh, <laughs> Just absolutely tearing up Josh McDaniel. It was Daniels. That was just beautiful. What an absolute ass hat of a coach. <laughs> like you can't have fun and you can't play football. You got to be all serious. Come on, man. What an indictment. Uh, finally, the probably the most searing thing I've heard from anybody sort of officially from the organization and Hopefully we can put that jackass to bed now, but uh, it was just still really good to hear. I want to hear what you guys think of what Mayor had to say. All right, bye. There you go, honors in Oakland, and we talked about it in the in the segment previous to this. Brought Mo it brought it up, and um, I I think yes, it's an indictment. Now listen, <laughs> you don't hear that a lot about Belichick, right? Who has if this is where supposedly Josh McDaniels learned this whole system and all that stuff. But the difference is he's got he's got those Super Bowl rings, man. He had a I think players are willing to accept things at a certain level if if you know that this guy has had a long list, a long resume as a head coach of accomplishing things. Uh, but it's clearly showed that in that introductory press conference, Mo, when when Josh McDaniel said he learned about his experience in Denver, he really didn't. Yeah, I was I was willing to give him a second chance. Like I said, hey, you know, everyone, not everyone, but most people deserve a second chance to right their wrongs, correct some of the mistakes. Sometimes we go into situations early in our careers. Josh Williams is very young as a head coach, I believe in his 30s, mm -hmm. early 30s, when he was the head coach of the Denver Broncos. And now he's in he was an older, older guy, mid 40s. He figured, okay, he's grown. He's learned from his mistakes. He talked about learning from his mistakes during the introductory press conference, right? He talked about that, building relationships and 
valuing the relationships in the building and it's not just being an X's and O's guy, but but building those bonds with players, and staff, and everyone around. None of that came to fruition. <laughs> and you heard Michael, yeah. and I just brought Zero. it up before Andres on the call that Michael Mayer clearly was not enjoying the Josh McDaniels regime and what was going on in Las Vegas while Josh McDaniels was the head coach. A lot of people kind of twisted his words as to say, oh, he's only motivated because they drafted Brock Bowers. I don't think that's it. I think it's the fact that he, along with a lot of other players, young and veteran players, just didn't enjoy playing under Josh McDaniels. Now, some people say, well, they're getting paid millions of dollars. Who cares if they enjoy the game? And as you said, I think that's part of it. If your players aren't enjoying coming to work, it some a lot of times it just doesn't translate, doesn't work out. And I and I'm not saying enjoying your job automatically turns into optimal results, but I think it's part of the equation. If guys like staying late to practice rather than you forcing them to stay long hours and not getting a lot of results, it's a different, it's a different different atmosphere. You saw it as soon as Antonio Pierce was named the interim head coach and the Raiders, of course, they were winning when they beat the Giants and the Jets. But you could tell the difference in just the players' demeanor. It's like they can just kind of take a deep breath and <sighs> I could just enjoy football again. It's not it's not a job job. I, I Yeah, it's my job to go out there and play football and play at a high level. But now I enjoy my job versus, man, I'm getting paid, but, man, I, I'm dreading coming to practice. I'm dreading <laughs> staying late. I'm dreading playing in this complicated complex offense this dude is you know not a people person it, it it makes a difference trust me it does and i'll tell you this we still have to see what antonio pierce is able to do as a head coach with a full season we don't know and for those of us who at initially had called for for example interviewing jim harbaugh and all that stuff when you hear michael mayer say something like this and then you i look back at the 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 advocating for Antonio Pierce. And we knew it was coming out of an emotional place because of what they had lived through. But it's much more understandable too for me, Mo, uh, to look in, to put myself in, in Mark Davis's shoes and say, okay, I went out, I got this hot guy that was supposedly going to be a great head coach and it didn't work out. So now where the team is at with the players on the team. And of course, Max Crosby was so outspoken about Antonio Pierce. We know this and that he even at the point said, hey, well, if if it's not him, then maybe I'm not here, right? He, he even said that. Some considered a threat. Others just thought he was just being honest. Either way you think, you could see now well, the, the words that, that we heard from Michael Mayer, why it happened and why Mark Davis said, you know what? I have belief in Antonio Pierce. He doesn't have experience, yes. But I think for right now, where our team is at, this is what is going to be best for this team moving forward. And we'll see how that all plays out. But it really does offer me really some internal, I think, exposure to what maybe Mark Davis was thinking. Yeah, right. You're, you're not necessarily saying, well, just choose the head coach that players like. But I think we have a tendency, and you see this in politics as well, is that when a certain personality doesn't work out in a leadership position, sometimes it's best to go in the opposite. So if you have a disciplinarian, you may go with someone who's a little more of a quote unquote players coach. Right. If you had a players coach and the players ran over him, then you may go for more of a disciplinarian if you were loose. So, like the Chargers situation is the reverse of the Raiders, where the Chargers um, team, Brendan Staley, I. I kind of classify him as a player's coach, but he was also, I, I think he was just kind of loose with details simply because not just because of the fourth down stuff, but the chargers to me were an undisciplined underachieving team. Now they've been there for a while, but mm -hmm. even more so under Brandon Staley. And I think they needed more of a, I, you know, a more of a disciplinarian type coach, like a Jim Harbaugh, someone who's more hard nose. So maybe in that, in that scenario, Jim Harbaugh is a better fit for the chargers than what the Raiders needed because teams were in different places last year so you have to look at what type of team do i have what did we go through when we weren't playing well and what do the players seem to respond to and the players seem to respond to antonio pierce very well and that's why i said antonio pierce is my number two head coach candidate simply because the players took to him they obviously believe in him and the raiders got results you know they were five and four under antonio pierce regardless of the circumstances i know they played a bunch of backups and i pointed that out but they did win those games and it and it did he did change the atmosphere almost immediately. So I understand 
why Mark Davis made the decision to have Antonio Pierce on and, and hire him. No, and what you said about Staley is so true because you look at that's why so many people they talk about oh everybody always picks the Chargers to win the last you know the national media blah blah because you look at them on a paper and you see the talent. But how many times did the Chargers, including that amazing playoff game against the Jaguars, blow leads late? And that tells you, I think you're right. That tells you a lack of discipline and a lack of focus, which to me is always going to come on. Now, you might have a, pl a player who's like that, and then they end up sitting or you get rid of them, whatever it may be. But when you have that like just systemically happening to your team over and over again under a head coach, you have to look at the coach. So good job, Anders. Thanks for the call, man. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're going, we always talk about it on this show, Mo. We get calls from everywhere, all over the world. And today we got a call from Canada, Alan in the great white North here on the Raider nation mailbag. Hello, this is uh, Alan from Canada. This, these questions are more for Mo who I've really followed closely on X, but obviously you guys are both capable of taking a crack at it. But uh, Mo, I really love your GM style thoughts through the off season, you know, early and then into the draft, you know, you've got sort of this very objective style that matters for making for a great read and gives a lot of clarity. That's hard to get when you're a real fan. Uh, I do have a request for you. Now that you've had an off season, kind of figure out what this regime will do and been able to compare what you thought would happen to what actually happened. Would you be able to do articles or segments on the following? Number one would be what players left in the free agent pool will the Raiders target post June 1st? Number two, who will be the players that the Raiders target for extensions before the season starts? And number three, in retrospect, which other players do you think the Raiders had on their board during the first three picks of the draft that they didn't select? Anyways, I love the show. You guys do an awesome job. Thank you so much for your hard work. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. Another excellent call we always get from our listeners. That's from Alan up in Canada. And brought some good points there, Mo. I'll let you answer number one. He talked about uh, a couple different issues there. One is the free agents. We talked about a little bit earlier in the show about the cornerbacks, uh, but then extensions. That's a really interesting one because I see a lot of folks talking about, oh, why aren't they going to give Spillane a con uh, an extension? Why are they going to give this guy, uh, Malcolm Kuntz, uh, an extension? Um, with a new GM there, and even though those guys played well last year, they were not guys that Tom Telesco bought, brought in. Uh, when you look at extensions, we saw Max Crosby last week get a $6 million raise on his deal, which he obviously deserved. But when you look at players who might be eligible for extensions right now mo do you see anybody that tom telesco would prioritize at this point well first of all i want to say thank you to alan for appreciating the style of <laughs> covering the team that i have and i put forth every year and i've done for you know a decade plus because let me tell you alan you're one of the rare people because a lot of people <laughs> did not appreciate my objectivity last week i'll tell you no. that uh nope. so i thank you alan for for hanging in there with me and following me on the X and, and reading my articles and listening to the show or in bleach report lives. If you hear them, appreciate you now on to the questions. I, I would say I'll take the, the free agent questions. I think that's a good article. I usually do um, free agent articles after mandatory mini camp. So let's say the Raiders don't make any notable moves or sign any notable veterans. I usually have an article mid to late June, you know, free agents that the Raiders would still be interested in signing or guys that they would be interested in bringing in via trade because of the post June one cuts that work that are going to happen. They're always going to be a pool of veterans available between mandatory mini camp and training camp. So I will have a piece out on that. So I don't want to spoil it on the show. Alan, look out for that. As far as extensions are concerned, there are two names, three names that pop up a lot. You mentioned one, Robert Spillane, right? I don't think Robert Spillane is going to get an extension because one, he, Linebacker position doesn't have a long shelf life. And as you said, Tom Telesco didn't originally sign Robert Spillane. He signed a two-year deal under the previous regime. Now, Patrick Graham is still there, but now Tom Telesco is the GM. So I would assume that Tom Telesco wants to see what Robert Spillane could do. The other thing is the Raiders drafted Tommy Eichenberg, and Antonio Pierce seems excited about Eichenberg. The coaching staff seems excited about Tommy Eichenberg. Tommy Eichen Eichenberg could be the replacement for Robert Spillane, where they may not re-sign Spillane and Tommy Eichenberg may take over and the Raiders may draft another linebacker. I said, I called this this year that 
the Raiders would draft a linebacker just because of Tom Telesco's draft history. I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted another linebacker a little earlier next year, and you have two young guys at linebacker and Eichenberg and whoever they draft. The other extension name I want to bring up is Malcolm Coons, and I think that's one that I could see happening simply because with the edge rusher position being a premium position, the price is only going to go up. So if, if, if Coons has a double-digit sack season, the Raiders are going to pay more than they would have paid if they don't extend him this offseason. So I could see that. Even though Tom, uh, Tom Telesco wasn't there last year to see uh, Malcolm Kuntz is blooming up close and personal, you can look at the numbers and tell he's growing. Extend him now before the price increases if he has another strong <laughs> season. Uh, the other name, the third name that I'll bring up is Devon Diablo. Bugs. A lot of Raider fans want to see Devon Diablo get an extension. I know some players say he's an underrated player on the roster. Divine Diablo, not the greatest in coverage yet. I still want to see more from Divine Diablo before I sign him to an extension. And again, I have the belief that the Raiders will draft a linebacker early next year and that whoever they draft could be next to Tommy Eichenberg as their top two. So I'm not in a rush to re-sign or extend Divine Diablo or Robert Blaine. I am in a rush to extend Malcolm Kuntz because of the cost at his position. Makes a lot of sense. Alan in Canada, man. Thanks for the call. Appreciate that very much. All right, we move on. Our good friend NorCal Raider is next up here on the Raider Nation mailbag on Silver and Black today. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. Uh, this is NorCal Raider. Uh, I'm calling in regards to uh, the advocate for uh, Mo Moten. You know, I, I'm here to, on his side, and I agree with him. I agree with the stuff he says. You know, I like that he's candid about his stuff, respectfully candid. Um, my... I, I agree with um, the record. I think it's going to be 9-8 and eight just because I've wanted for a long time, and it's been an unpopular conversation with a lot of people. Some people might say I'm crazy, but I would have liked to remove um, Devontae Adams. Just just do the guy a solid and move him to a team that's going to be a competitor. Um, you know, if you're going to have a guy just like Devontae Adams on your team, you have to have a quarterback to compliment him. Um, you know, so that's, that's my thought with that. And some people have said that, you know, last year, oh, you have Devontae. Yeah, but who's throwing to Devontae? I would have liked cutting them since last year's 22 because we could have gotten a first round draft pick and, and picked the quarterback or somebody a little somebody we can use in the future because Devontae Adams is not a future anymore. He's the person that's, that's going to be seeking a, a Super Bowl here. That's what he's, that's probably his angle, and um, and, that, and that's one of the reasons that I disagree with keeping him. Since ever since we got rid of Carr, I would have liked removing him because that was a plan with Carr to keep Carr him together, and then next thing you know, we end up going a different direction. So, and then also, it's going to be a tough season because Antonio Pierce is going to depend a lot on his coordinators. Um, I don't know exactly the philosophy that, that um, our new coordinator is going to run, but last year, uh, to, to my uh, what I'm thinking right now, I believe the Colts had a really good coordinator, but I can't remember his name. But he was really good, and he, and he got the best of uh, of Minshew last year. So I, ju I just I just believe in um, building for the future, and um, you know, Antonio Pierce wants to be there for the long haul. You know, at least there's no reason to say you have Devontae Adams if you're not going to utilize them correctly. So, especially with the with the quarterback, you're not that's just doing a disservice to the guy. But that's all I got. You know, keep it up, Momo. You know, keep keep being positive. You know, I love how you know your stance on things. And, you know, I agree with it. Uh, you know, you guys are great. You know, you guys are entertaining this off season. But that's all I got. Thanks. All right, there you go, NorCal Raider. Yes, Mo is not a hater because he tells the truth or is objective. So, so we appreciate him noticing that. And Mo, you know what? Like, like you said, you got some heat last week, but most of our listeners, I think, are pretty level-headed. Scott, where was the support last week when I was getting killed? <laughs> okay. I'm just joking. Alan yeah. and North Carolina, I appreciate y'all guys. But like I said, the, the pendulum was way on the left side last week it was. when I gave my predictions. And it, it, it everyone from, you know, grandmothers and mothers and uncles and dads were coming after me when I gave my predictions, but we'll get to North Cal Raiders call. Uh, the whole Devonta Adams thing, I, I think Raider nation, believe it or not, is kind of 50, 50 on that. If I went on my bleach report live and I talked about, you know, the rumors about maybe trading Devonta Adams. A lot of fans on, on my bleach report live didn't like the idea. I made the point that even with a young quarterback, you want to go to wide receiver. The Raiders didn't get that quarterback to that young quarterback who they feel has a high potential in the first round to develop into the guy. I still feel like you need a Devontae Adams, even with this offense. But I think what Noah Kyle Raider is getting to is that if you don't have a team that can win now, mm. then why not entertain trading Devontae Adams 
and kind of starting over that because that's what it seems like i know Kyrene, you can correct me if i'm wrong in this but that's what it seems like you're alluding to is basically the tear down of okay trade Devonta adams get the draft picks and maybe use that draft pick to move up or get a quarterback and kind of start fresh because Devonte adams isn't in his 20s you know how many optimal years does Devonte adams really have left in his career and is he going to be happy if he's not getting the football the way he should be getting it from Aiden O'Connell and Garner Minshew. It's something to consider. Let me tell you, Raider Nation, I'm not advocating for this, <laughs> but prepare for this. If the Raiders aren't playing well by the time they get to the trade deadline, those Devontae Adams trade rumors are going to ramp up times a thousand because they're going to be a lot of, they're going to be a few teams out there that need a wide receiver to step up and elevate their quarterback, and they're going to be have maybe a better record than the Raiders and a lot of these national media outlets, a lot of these pundits, a lot of these people who draw up these trade scenarios are going to say Devontae Adams should be a top trade target because the Raiders are going nowhere. They're three and five and Devontae Adams contract. He's going to be do a lot more money next year. If the Raiders don't restructure him. So I'm not, again, I'm not advocating for this, but I'm saying if the Raiders aren't playing well by the trade deadline, those Devontae Adams trade rumors are going to ramp back up. So no count Raider, you're probably going to be happy to hear that. But I, I want to see what Devontae Adams could do with the Gardner Minshew or with the Aiden O'Connell in year two. Because let's say Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell do play well. Then you're going to say, well, it's a good thing they didn't trade Devontae Adams because you need him to elevate your quarterback. Because we all know Devontae Adams is, is a star. Minshew, a low-level starter. We'll see what happens with what Aiden O'Connell is, but he's going to be the guy to elevate the quarterback position because, no, they don't have another pass catcher who can do that right now. And those rumors around the trade deadline, especially if your friends that are Jets fans oh, are gosh. in the playoff hunt and are doing oh, well gosh. with Aaron Rodgers, you're, yep. you, you can bet those are going to come up. But you bring yep. up another good point. We've talked about this. And NorCal Ratter, thanks for your call again, which is Devontae Adams. And, and I agree with you. I don't I don't think they, they, they would trade him now. But if you look at the contract structure, you mentioned it, right? So this year, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he's $40 million against the cap. He gets $67 million in cash. Cash doesn't matter, right? It's not going towards the 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 cap like 17 that. and a half uh as well going uh, in oh sorry cash yes cumulative cash excuse me in the course of contract he's 17 this year and 40 against the cap next year uh it goes up to 36 million right and so to me this is why i always looked at we talked about it i don't know a month and a half ago mo that i think Devonte adams is the prime candidate for a restructure if i'm tom telesco and he's open to it I would do that because then if things don't work out and that, I would even sell it to him and say, look, we want to restructure. Uh, you're going to get a bunch of cash up front, but at the same time, you know, if things don't work out for you here, you're going to be a lot easier to move than you would be if we keep the structure and you're making 36 million over the next two years. So to, to me, if the Raiders uh, want to do him a solid, if things don't work out for them and trade him, then to me that restructure would be would be massive for him and i still think they're going to try whether or not he's open to it and accepts it is a different thing i would if i was him because he's going to get more cash up front and uh, at his age it gives a lot more flexibility for them to move him if they need to so we'll see how it goes i, I want to be ahead. clear about this i i i do think Devonte adams is going to is going to finish the season as a Raider. I don't I think do the Raiders will trade him. I think he will accept the restructure simply because, remember, he was one of the most vocal guys to keep Antonio Pierce. The Raiders did do that. Of course, now they have Tom Telesco as a GM. But when you look at kind of the face of this team right now, the, the you know, the liability of this team, it's Max Crosby and Devontae Adams. On, defense, on the defensive side for Max Crosby on the offense, it's it's – clearly Devontae Adams since they don't have their quarterback yet. So I think that's also important to keep your leadership intact when you're trying to build up your football team. So I do think Devontae Adams does finish the year as a Raider. And for those optimists in Raider Nation, there's a lot of them out there right now, which is great. You don't know what's going to happen at quarterback. Yes, we Mo and I talk about the fact that long term, they don't have, we don't think they don't have the long term solution at quarterback. But Aiden O'Connell, Gardner Minshew could have very good years, and so could Devontae Adams, and their connection is good. And if that happens, that's even more reason why you wouldn't even think about trading him. I mean, if you're on the cusp and they surpass what you predicted, Mo, on wins, if they're at 10 wins, if they somehow, by the grace of God, get to 11 wins and they just have a great year, and Devontae Adams is a big part of that, 
then you could see them say, well, geez, we're a, we made the playoffs. Uh, why would we get rid of Devonte Adams? We're going to make that next step. Uh, and obviously he would feel better about being a Raider too, if they had some success where he's at in his career. So we'll see how that all rolls out. All right. NorCal Raider. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate, appreciate the call. Yeah, absolutely. 702-900-7869. And thank you for praising Mo and not calling him a hater um, for his objective analysis. It's always nice. So thank you for that. All right. We're getting to our last call now. This is Raider Izzy. We know Raider Izzy. Here he is. What up, fellas? It's, uh, it's Raider Izzy. Uh, thanks for clarifying my question last week, kind of uh, in regards to the salary cap and the money that's coming up on June 1st. Um I, I do appreciate that. Um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, we'll start with the comment first. We, um, you guys uh, kind of talked a little bit about the undrafted free agents and so you were going to kind of go into, um, you know, as, as we get a little bit further along in the off season, you're going to kind of go into them a little bit more. Two names I wanted to bring up that I've, um, I've kind of already done like a deep dive. Uh, Tulu Griffin, Mississippi State. I actually, I actually think it's, Oh. I really think um, a lot of people are talking about lobby with uh, the new uh, the new kickoff rules and everything like that. I, I think he's the one that could be a really big piece of that, especially if, if Dylan Lobby's going to be like the kind of a, a third down back type with us. I, I think that, that Griffin could be a major asset. There's a phenomenal kick returner, but he's also has a ton of juice. He could be very effective with the offense too. Uh, another one's um, actually Noah Shannon from Iowa's defensive tackle. Uh, no one's really talking about him. He would have been drafted a lot higher if he wasn't. He got suspended his final year at Iowa for uh, for gambling, of all things. Um, he has a lot of upside, and not a lot of people are talking about him. Check him out. When you get a minute, check him out. Um, he is very disruptive, so he might actually be a lot of fun. Um, all right, quick question for you now. Um, I've been trying to figure out um, Luke Jesse's offense and what to expect. The, the games I've been watching from the Bears were actually the Tyson Bajan games. Um, reason being, I know there's a lot of talk out there with Justin Fields not, you know, not being coachable and all this stuff. Um, Bajan kind of ran a different offense there. So I've kind of been watching those games, and obviously they killed us uh, in Chicago. But those games, the play calling was actually pretty good. Um, I'm curious if you think that, that those are good games to watch, too, over Justin Fields. Um, just because of the fact that it's, it's, you know, kind of different play calling. I'm wondering if that's more what, what Getty wants to do. But, um, yeah, give me your thoughts on that. Love the show as always, though. So later. All right, there you go. Raider Izzy with a bunch of good stuff there, too. Uh, the kid from from Iowa, the only thing I'd be concerned there, he did get suspended for gambling. And I don't know that bringing him to Las Vegas would, you know, no matter how talented he is, I don't know if that's a good mix or not. Uh, but, but Mo, what are your thoughts there on uh, Raider Izzy's call, especially the end there? He was talking about uh, Luke Getze, which we continue to talk about. It's going to be a big story, I think, for everybody, including us in this offseason until we start to see him actually run the offense when we get to uh, the season here in three months and 12 days, by the way. When you look at Getze, is there anything, anything that folks can learn watching tape of the bears or anything that that will translate we just don't know what he's going to do if and how he's going to change the, the, based on the talent and who he has in las vegas one thing that i did notice and i'll do a deeper dive over the summer before training camp of luke getsy one thing that i did notice between luke getsy running the offense with justin fields and tyson bajan is now he did now he did try to simplify things for Tyson Bajan, but it seemed like he just didn't trust Justin Fields. Mm. When I watched the Justin Fields game, you know, a lot of, a lot of people say, well, Luke Etsy did a lot of short stuff. And to me, it was more about maybe he just didn't trust Justin Fields. And Justin Fields talked about him being robotic early in the season under Luke Getsy. And I think part of it is he's not going to say this at the podium. He's going to praise Justin Fields, of course, but I just didn't feel like he tailored the offense to show Justin Fields' arm, or maybe there are questions about his downfield accuracy. Whereas I think Tyson Bajan, as as Ray Izzy pointed out, offense is called a, a lot different, a little bit differently, in my opinion, as well. And there was some success. Now, Bajan wound up falling apart eventually as <laughs> teams started to get more film on him. But I think the difference here is let's remember Bajan, more of an athletic quarterback, can move around on, you know, inside and outside the pocket. Major is more athletic, in my opinion, than Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. So I don't know how much of that is going to translate. 
when Lou Getze has Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew, how much is he? How much is there going to be overlap between how he called plays with Bajent and how he's going to call plays with those two guys? But let's just remember that, and this is, goes back to my point about I'm a, I would be okay with the Raiders acquiring Trey Lance is because Lou Getze, for most of his play calling career, has had athletic mobile quarterbacks, and if Aiden O'Connell, Aiden O'Connell is by far going to be his least athletic quarterback he has if Aiden O'Connell wins the job. So I'll be interested to see how he runs the offense if Aiden O'Connell wins the job. Gardner Minshew, as I said, has some mobility, not the most athletic quarterback, but has more athleticism than Aiden O'Connell, clearly. I'm interested to see how he runs the offense, period, because very these these two quarterbacks are different than what he had in Chicago. So I don't know how much Raider is the overlap there's going to be. I'm going to be keying into the preseason. Of course, you know, offenses don't show everything in the preseason, but I'll be interested to see what it looks like from the jump in August, whether it's Aiden O'Connell or Garner Minshew. Right. And the other thing here too is, and it, it didn't happen last year because of the, the coaching switch, but Antonio Pierce has been sort of clear on how he wants the offense to run. So you also have to consider that Luke Getz, is going to come in and yeah, he runs the offense and, and, and Antonio Pierce is going to be like, yeah, it's your offense. But there's going to be some dictates, in my view, about how it's run and how aggressive they are. Everything we've heard from Coach Pierce so far to me. So he's got input there as the head coach that, that last year you couldn't do. I mean, they could change little things here and there. Obviously, he did that at quarterback, which was a big deal. But I think that's going to play into it, too. So I think you're right, Mo. I don't know how much we're going to be able to, to glean from his days in Chicago because it's a different situation, different personnel, as you pointed out. And so it's going to be, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens and what he does. One more note, Raider Izzy, is that I think you're going to get a more collaborative play calling approach this year where Josh McDaniels was clearly the lead primary play caller. I, I, I'm not in the building, but I highly doubt there was much input from the other assistants. It was just Josh McDaniels was going to call plays his way, and that's how he wanted it to be run. Whereas this year, I, I think with even with Luke Getzey, even though he is the offensive coordinator, you might get a little more input out of Scott Turner, who is the passing game coordinator. So while Luke Getzey ran his offense a certain way, he may, because he's a younger play call, a, a less experienced play call than Josh McDaniels, he may allow more input from his assistant, Scott Turner, who is the passing game coordinator. So you may see wrinkles that we didn't see out of Luke Getzey's offense in Chicago. So just keep that in mind that you may get a more collaborative approach from the coaching staff from a play calling perspective. Absolutely. All right. There you go, Raider Izzy. Thanks for your call, man. We appreciate it. If you want to call into the show for Thursday, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Leave your name where you're calling from, your comment or question. We appreciate it. So thank you so much for being with us on that. All right, Mo, uh, I know it's we're, we're kind of in that weird period with the NFL, but tell everybody what you got coming up this week so they can look for it wherever you may be dropping it. Over on Bleacher Report, I'm going to go over the depth chart, early look at the depth chart, not necessarily solidifying who's going to make the 50 man, but we'll just go through the positions, the positions that are up for grabs. I had a sports not piece on that, on the most contested positions on the Raiders roster. Go check that out. But I'll be going over the entire depth chart over on Bleacher Report on Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Over on Sportsnet, I will have another piece. Maybe I'll maybe I'll take one of Alan's uh, ideas. I yeah. know he did also bring up, uh, you know, guys who the Raiders may have drafted that they didn't draft that may have been on their board. Maybe I'll take that idea, Alan, or spin it or have some type of remix to it. So appreciate Alan again for bringing up some ideas to bring up during this sort of dead period in the off season, even <laughs> though there are OTAs going on. That's right. So we will, uh, we'll talk about Mo's piece, I'm sure on Thursday, uh, when we come on the show here. So make sure you join us, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're on YouTube, thanks for being in the chat there. Uh, make sure you subscribe and hit the notifications bell. All right, Mo, we will talk to you again on Thursday, my friend. Sounds good. All right, for everybody here at uh, uh, Silver and Black today, including our guy at Odyssey Sports, our producer, Mike Robier, want to thank him. And for Momotin, I'm Scott Branson. Thanks for being with us, guys. We will see you later in the week. Enjoy it. Bye-bye.